Part 14. The War Office. When I left my charming hosts in the Chateau d'Ierry, I went over to England to attend the big summer congress of the British Society of Dowsers and meet a number of England's leading diviners and their president, Colonel A. H. Bell, who was, and still is, the mainstay of the society. The British society has not the international flavor of the French society which attracts delegates from all over the world and was of particular interest to me, because of the different methods of approach to divining which were discussed and illustrated. Yet, like most English undertakings, the British society was most thorough in its methods, and every idea was well tested and tried before being accepted. There, I met the old type of professional diviner, who used a forked hazel or willow rod and did very fine work, as well as others who studied divining from a psychic point of view and various engineers, geologists, and newspaper reporters. Before the afternoon was over I found I had let myself in for a series of lectures in London and other parts of England. After the meeting I suddenly became the subject of a publicity campaign in the English press. Even conservative newspapers like the Morning Post published an article about me and my work, based on the fact that the War Office had called in dowsers to find water on Salisbury Plain. In the news chronicle the headline, Army SOS to Woman Diviner helping to save maneuvers, was splashed right across the page. In nearly every paper I opened there were banner headlines such as, The Most Mystifying Woman in the World, Water Witch with Wavy Hands, The Lady of the Waters, and so on, illustrated with photographs of me at work. There was one really good photograph in the Illustrated London News, showing me divining with my bare hands, without tools. I got quite excited when Gaumon British wanted to make a film of me working for the war office on Salisbury Plain. Thinking that it would probably be the only time in my life when I could figure as a movie star, I jumped at the offer. Colonel Bell accompanied me to Salisbury Plain but, alas, when we arrived there, we were informed that although Gaumon British had called at the camp with their equipment they had been immediately sent away as F was to work in a very hush-hush area. I was bitterly disappointed. When I arrived at the office of the colonel in charge of this divining test, I found it full of generals and other brass hats, with a sprinkling of less exalted ranks. I was introduced to them collectively, and felt that I was being studied like an insect under a microscope by entomologists. This scrutiny made me feel horribly uncomfortable and extremely annoyed. So, when I had received all my instructions from the officer in charge, I turned to the generals and said, I don't know where all you gentlemen think you are going, but you are not going with me. I never have people with me when I work. Since I was not in the army there was nothing they could do about this. When I got back to the office after having found several good water locations in the rough grass and scrub, and having the satisfaction of hearing that they had already been indicated by other diviners, I was asked whether I would help in testing a number of young engineer officers to see whether any of them had the gift of divining. This I willingly did, and spent a most lively and amusing afternoon. Some of those I tested had the gift to a quite remarkable degree. In making this test, England was following in the footsteps of France, where the Ministry of War had inaugurated a school of divining for its engineer officers. The test led to my meeting many unusual people in London and the offer of many queer jobs. One young newspaper reporter paid me several visits, not with any idea of publicizing me, but to save my soul. He implored me to give up using maps which, he insisted, could only be made to work with the aid of the devil. When it came to his flopping on his knees and praying long and loud for my lost soul, and trying to make me do likewise, I walked out of my flat and left him to it. I also had a visit from a sporting gentleman. He had lists of horses for some of the big English racing fixtures and wanted me to pick the winners he offered to share the profits on a 50-50 basis. He grew very annoyed when I refused to degrade my gift by using it for gambling. End of part 14